watching a special program on 74 years of Israel's independence. Well, the United Nations, which was founded in 1945, played an instrumental role in the country's founding. Competing powers at the time, such as the USSR, the United States, and the colonial power, Great Britain, all had vested interests in how British-mandated Palestine would be divided between the Jews and the Arabs. Well, fast forward 74 years, and Israel has a thorny relationship with the UN, which it often accuses of being disproportionate in its criticism of Israel. Well, joining me here in the studio, Hillel Neuer is a lawyer and the director of UN Watch. Uh, Hillel, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you for coming in. And thanks to you. Thank you. Uh, so um, if we could kind of step back into history uh, just for a moment, uh, how would you characterize the relationship between the nascent state of Israel and the UN as it was back in, in 1948? Well, they were both idealistic. You know, uh, Israel was just created. The UN is also relatively new. You had a brilliant ambassador that Israel had, Abba Iban, one of the great orators of the 20th century representing Israel. So there was a, a mutual idealism at the time, and the UN saw itself as a contributor to Israel's creation. So certainly in the early years, there was a very positive spirit. And uh, of course, at the time, the world was very different to, to the world as we know it today. There were a, a lot of competing interests in what was then uh, British-mandated Palestine. And how did those rivalries play out at the UN? Well, there uh, certainly when the UN was created, the Cold War began right away. That dominated for several decades the politics at the UN. And the amazing thing was was the historic vote on 29 November 1947 in support of creating two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state, got the support both of the United States and of the Soviet Union. That was sort of the miracle. America was in play, but the fact that the Soviet Union as well supported the creation of Israel was something that was a very unlikely coincidence to happen at the time of the Cold War, that the two great powers actually agreed on the creation of the Jewish state. And, and just a year after uh, Israel's declaration of independence, it was admitted to, uh, to the UN. Of course, it couldn't join before because it, it wasn't an actual state. Uh, how did that kind of change the way things were? Well, uh, to be a recognized independent state at that time as today, one wanted to be represented at the UN. So as you said, first Israel had the, the, the nascent, the Pre-Israel won the 1947 vote, as the Arabs did too, but they rejected it. Uh, they could have had a Palestinian state back in 29 November 1947. They rejected it. And um, then, then there was Israel became a state, and then in 1949 it was admitted. That was another battle. Actually, they lost the first vote to be admitted, and they won the second vote in May 1949. And then Israel took its seat at the place of nations, and that was significant. And uh, we we'll look uh, at how the relationship has developed over the years, uh, and it, it hasn't always been easy, has it? That's something no. Understand. Look, the, the UN changed. By the 1960s, you had many dictatorships emerge. The Soviet Union became influential. I would say the UN and many of its bodies became hijacked. The Human Rights Council in Geneva, where I'm based, uh, now has members like China, Cuba, Venezuela, Libya, Eritrea, some of the world's worst violators of human rights are sitting at the United Nations as judges and guardians of human rights. And not surprisingly, they divert much of the attention to singling out Israel for demonization. And uh, you, you've been advocating um, for many years for Israel's fair treatment uh, at the UN. Um, you've argued that it is often singled out for condemnation. You, you just mentioned a list of countries who are accused of, of grave human rights violations. Uh, can you give us some examples where Israel's been singled out and other countries um, have, have kind of gotten away with things? Sure. I'm going to give you three quick examples. You know, number one, in New York at the General Assembly, there's one resolution every year on Syria, one on Iran, one on North Korea, and 15 on Israel. No other, no other country in the world has anything close to that amount of condemnation. The Human Rights Council in Geneva, one agenda item on the world, one agenda item at every meeting on Israel alone. And finally, next month, the Human Rights Council will hear from their commission of inquiry into discrimination in Israel. It's headed by Navi Pillay, who has signed manifestos entitled Sanction Apartheid Israel. So she's the independent, neutral, objective judge of the UN into whether there's discrimination. And she is literally lobbying countries around the world to sanction apartheid Israel. It's absurd. It's a violation of the UN's founding principles, including impartiality. And it's only Israel gets that kind of treatment. Do you have a theory as to why that is? Why Israel is singled out when other countries aren't? There's real politique. There are 56 Muslim states. Historically, they have sponsored these resolutions. Yes, there's the Abraham Accords, but hasn't yet 
change things at the UN in a significant way. 56 Muslim states voting against Israel. They have enormous amount of oil. They have UN votes. The UN works by vote trading. So there's 56 votes for your country if you vote for the anti-Israel resolution versus one vote from Israel if you vote no. Uh, and I would say there's also a residual... The Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> right, but there's also, I would say, you know, there's also residual anti-Semitism. The fact that of all the countries in the world, it is only the Jewish state. And you go across the board at the UN, the General Assembly, World Health Organization, the Human Rights Council, one country gets singled out and demonized. It's the Jewish state. All right. Hillel Noya, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.